So um, our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Mary Edmondson. Dr. Edmondson is a clinical associate in psychiatry at Duke University and a member of the Duke Huntington's Disease Specialty Program there. She's board certified in both internal medicine and psychiatry, which really makes her uniquely qualified to manage the very complex set of symptoms that arise in the context of Huntington's disease. Um, she's been involved in the care of Huntington's disease families for most of her life as a clinician, investigator, and advocate. Her efforts are motivated in part by her own family history of Huntington's disease in her father, which led her to seek genetic testing for herself personally. Um, she was fortunate to have tested negative, but this experience really has shaped her perspective in the management of Huntington's disease, and she will tell you about her story today in part. Her talk is titled, Dealing with Dilemma, Emotional and Psychological Impacts of Genetic Testing in Huntington's Disease. So I'm from Eastern North Carolina. I grew up in a little town called Greenville, North Carolina, you know, like houses several blocks apart. So I have very humble roots and to um, be invited to come here to Columbia to speak um, was really quite an honor for me. And I was doing pretty good. You know, I met Dr. Applebaum. I was kind of okay with that. And I was okay with following Wendy Chung who gave a great presentation. <clears throat> and then Nancy Wexler walks in. <laughs> and uh, so Nancy, I've known Nancy a long time and um, she could probably do this talk better than me, but I'm <laughs> really happy to be here. <laughs> so um, I like starting my talks with stories, minus Nancy. And so this is a picture of myself and my sister. And um, about a week ago, the two of us were sitting in our beautiful Carolina sunshine drinking a glass of sangria. And we were talking about a support group meeting that we had been to the night before where a young woman had come who was sort of in the throes of figuring out what she wanted to do um, in terms of genetic testing. And so we were talking about this and she said something to me that was really surprising. So we grew up together, we moved all over the country together during my father's illness. We both graduated from college the same day. She married a guy and took off didn't come home for 27 years. I mean, she came home, but she didn't live at home for 27 years. And um, I had sort of a different path. I went to medical school and so forth. And so there was this 27 year period of time where we like saw each other at you know Christmas and so forth, but we didn't share our lives in a very intimate way. So during our sangria conversation, she told me about something that I, I thought was really, um, really profound. She sort of told me her experience of how she dealt with being at risk for Huntington's. And, and she, she told me about how she was kind of racked with fear and she had all these physical symptoms that kind of tortured her for a long, long time. And she spent two years worrying this, this whole dilemma out she had. And at the end of it, she was praying. She was, you know, praying to her, her higher power. And she had a revelation. And that revelation was, she was thinking about Jesus Christ being in the Garden of Gethsemane and praying to have his suffering removed. And she said, I had this revelation. And that was that Jesus Christ knew exactly what it was like to be at risk for Huntington's disease. Because he could see, he could see exactly what was going to happen to him. He knew that he would be potentially humiliated. He would suffer publicly. And then he was going to die. And he had a sense of how he was going to die. And if you grow up in my family, you have a similar experience. We watched my dad suffer. We watched his illness progress. We watched how each of us dealt with Huntington's. And we watched how he died. And so each of us both knew that. So I'm not up here um, making a pitch for spirituality. Honestly, I'm not. But um, so there's a point that I'm going to come back to at the end that's going to be sort of based on my sister's um, my sister's uh, profound um, 
experience of dealing with Huntington's. So for those of you that don't know a lot about Huntington's disease, it's a complicated um, autosomal dominant disorder, um, adult onset, uh, usually anywhere from 35 to 45 years of age, people begin to develop symptoms. And they're complex. Um, there's a motor disorder associated with Huntington's called chorea. There's cognitive issues that start early and are the, really the only thing that tracks with disease course. So a progressive loss of executive functioning. There's difficulty with disorders of affect, meaning that there's um, uh, uh, mood symptoms, primarily um, depression, but there's also some specific um, behavioral uh, uh, disorders associated with Huntington's, including profound irritability and perseveration. And all of these things gradually get worse. Um, and then people also have, so hunting, the gene that causes Huntington's is in every cell of the body. So you might think it's just a neurologic disease, but it actually affects organs outside the nervous system and in fact has a, a pretty profound effect on metabolism. So people with Huntington's as their illness progress require more and more calories. So becoming um, malnourished is not an uncommon consequence of Huntington's. So in um, 1993, um, this showed up in my inbox. It was a paper inbox at the time, but uh, this showed up. A novel gene containing a trinucleotide repeat is expanded and unstable in Huntington's disease chromosomes. And so this was the discovery of the first autosomal dominant adult onset disorder ever. And it created... Um, a pretty interesting set of problems, some of which we've discussed today, some of which that have um, come to light as time has gone on. So one of the first things that happened was that there was a bunch of people that sat around, very smart people that sat around and said, so what are we going to do about this? Are we going to just provide this as a research tool or are we going to offer this clinically? And so the decision was made, well, if people are going to pursue this, then we need to make certain that we take good care of them as they're going through this process. So the Huntington's Disease Society of America um, created genetic testing guidelines that have been used for the past 20 years. And what they include is an episode, um, a, um, a time where you get together with a genetic counselor and they explain the course of the disease. Then you see a psychiatrist or a, a psychologist in my opinion, that's primarily to see if they're reversible psychiatric symptoms that, if treated, would make the course of going through testing easier. There's a neurology evaluation to make certain that it's not confirmatory testing, but predictive. We ask that people have a testing partner and that there's one month between when those visits occur, your blood is drawn, and when you come back to get your results and that the results are given in person. And Using this method, there have been thousands of people that have been um, investigated, and the, I'm going to run through some of the outcomes that have been discovered over the last 20 years. So the first thing is that there's very few catastrophic outcomes. And there's not many differences, actually, between those people who test positive and those people who test negative. And those, those differences in terms of adjustment and depressed mood and hopelessness, so and so forth, after three years, those differences dissipate. And there's actually 12 studies out of 28 that have been published looking at genetic testing in Huntington's that show improvement compared to baseline mental health sim symptoms in both groups. So what do people report are some of the good reasons? What are the, some, some of the positive benefits of this? Well, relief from uncertainty is a huge um, burden that's lifted off of someone, but also reduce psychological distress, depression, anxiety, an improved sense of well-being and coping me mechanisms. And the people that undergo this perceive it as being a positive experience. What about s specifically in people who test positive for the Huntington's disease gene? So they report an improved sense of personal control, an ability to plan for their future, it clarifies certain major life choices. Um, they can participate actively in the Huntington's family community. They can advocate for themselves and for the needs of their family. And they can participate in research. So what about bad outcomes? 
Well, they seem to be relatively evenly distributed between the people who post test positive and those people who test negative. And the thing that seemed to be the greatest predictor of a poor outcome was that you had um, difficulty on pretest measures, such as your Hamilton depression score would be poor. And so that would correlate with you having more difficulty with depression post-testing. So there was a, some kind of weak correlation between being single and being close to diagnosis or being a woman, but those correlated poorly and, and weren't replicated across studies. So why do people pursue testing? So the first, the main reason that's um, reported is to decrease uncertainty. Almost um, more than a third of people report that as their reasoning. The second is for life planning. Do I have kids? What career do I choose, et cetera? Connecting with um, other people. And I think one way of looking at this is that, um, that there's a lot of marginalization and disconnection in Huntington's families. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and this frees someone up to be able to engage with another community of people with whom they um, share a lot of common experiences. Um, life meanings and insights, social supports. Um, for example, if you have um, a sibling who has Huntington's and you're, you haven't been tested and you don't feel like you can ask for the support of those around you as you're coping with your sibling's illness, that would give you the freedom to be able to talk more openly and then hope and optimism. So who gets tested? Who's been tested? So prior to clinical testing, 56 to 81% of people said that they would undergo genetic testing were it available. But in fact, what's happened is that only about 10 to 20% of at-risk people have actually gotten tested. Now, there might be some um, evidence of recent increase in those numbers, but you know, that's generally not um, near what was predicted in terms of uptake. And so the, there was it's a multifactorial reason why people have stayed out of the public arena of um, genetic testing for Huntington's. Maybe it has something to do with sort of an avoidant coping style. Maybe it has to do with the fact that there's consequences when you are in a single versus a multiple payer healthcare system. Stigmatization is definitely an issue, and then lack of legal protection against discrimination. We'll talk about these last two in a little detail. What happens to people's intimate relationships after they go through genetic testing? So there's really not much of a statistically significant difference in couple functioning between those couples who undergo genetic testing and those that don't pursue testing. Um, gene carrier couples had a stronger relationship than non-carrier couples at 24, hour, uh, 24 months after follow-up. Disclosure variables seem to have an effect. So for example, if you know you're at risk for Huntington's disease and you tell your husband on your wedding night that you're at risk for Huntington's disease, that, wouldn't, that would portend for more difficulty in terms of your intimate relationships. Um, however, if you're open to some level of um, some degree that allows someone to make their choice and, and so that tends to have a less negative effect on intimate relationships. What did, what, what really is interesting though is that role shifts and unexpected results predict a negative outcome. Now what I mean by that is that if you marry someone and they know you're at risk and they decide they're going to do this because they want to take care of you and that gives them a sense of purpose in their life and then all of a sudden you go out and you get tested and you don't need them to take care of you anymore in your life. So that person then is like, okay, so what am I here for? So that's a role reversal. And it actually might be that before you get sick, if you're in this relationship with someone who's gonna take care of you, that actually you sort of throw a lot of chips into the bank ahead of time so that you're taking care of the person who's gonna take care of you later and so it can be some pretty wacky dynamics under those circumstances. The other thing is unexpected results. If someone believes they're gonna have Huntington's and they don't end up testing positive, it creates um, a whole void of, you know, what am I gonna do next? So the conclusion to this, from my point of view, is that pretest counseling can help people communicate better with each other so that this whole issue of disclosure variables gets ironed out before testing.
And post-testing counseling can help couple, couples navigate these role shifts and whatever might be unexpected about the results. So I have to say that um, I had all this talk done really well. And then yesterday afternoon, I realized I put nothing in here about reproduction. And there's a good reason for that. And, and that's because it's a really complex um, topic for me personally, as well as me professionally. Um, and, and part of that is that I do live in the public arena of Huntington's disease, and I did make my choices about kids, and I made choices that not everybody in this room would agree with. Um, and I don't know how many of you wouldn't agree with it, and I don't, I don't really, honestly, I'm not too interested to know. Um, but uh, I, I know that there are people that could potentially judge me living in this public world that I live in, <clears throat> and so that's why talking about reproductive choices is pretty diff difficult if you're a member of a Huntington's family. But it's also difficult because there's all kinds of choices to make, much more complicated than when I got married and all I had to do is decide if I wanted to get married and have kids. It's much more complicated now because of PGD, because, you know, if you get pregnant and you're at risk, do you go through um, prenatal testing? And if you do, do you abort the fetus? If you, if you get tested, you will not only know that your, your child is going to have Huntington's, you know you have Huntington's. Um, there's opportunities to do PGD, disclosing or non-disclosing. And then if you, I mean, there's even some like really around the back door ways that you can do linkage analysis to see if the, fe the fetus has inherited the affected grandparent's allele. So the idea being that you would abort that fetus, but that would mean you'd abort 50% 50 per, 50 chance that the fetus would be normal. And then there's variations of choice based on intermediate and incomplete penetrant cage repeat lengths, which was another slide, so I left it off. So um, looking at what's happened over the last 20 years, um, it's interesting that only 20% of tested positive individuals undergo assisted reproduction, and that's even in countries where finances are not a barrier. Um, and so that's, so if only 20% of people get tested, and half of those, which is not correct, but about, say roughly half of those people decide, or, or you know, test positive, and then there's only 20% of those people that undergo predictive genetic diagnosis, you can see that this is not, there's not huge uptake in, especially in the United States for this technology. I'd be interested to know what the experience here is at Columbia because you guys are one of the groups that, that do this more than you know, elsewhere. But in any case, also interesting that there's no difference in the number of pregnancies and mutation carriers compared to those people who test negative. And 58% of people who are gene carriers have more kids. 35% ceased having kids. So um, if you look at all the gene positive people or women who had children, now this sounds like, like a really weird study. I mean, who would look at this specific topic? But so at Indiana University, they've tested lots and lots of people and they did this um, general health questionnaire for all the people that they tested over the years. And so they have this data about people's, um, a lot of their private experience. And they went back and they looked at that data and they just pulled out the people that had, um, who had kids over the course of that time who were also tested. And so that's the group that they looked at. And what they discovered was that when the mother, when the, when the mother was the affected parent, that woman was more likely to have kids. And if a woman had more than three children, she was likely to have another kid, which I think is easy to explain. You know, there are people that, their um, identity is really based on being a mother, being a father. And so if they had three kids, you would, you know, what's one more? Um, the thing that I thought was really interesting was church attendance, which my sister will be really happy to know. Um, but actually, if there's other, in other diseases, attendance at church or spirituality tends to portray, portend um, you know, less depression, less substance abuse, um, le um, more um, positive um, experiences. And there was even a small study done in at-risk people. So you might say, okay, well, I don't want to pass this gene on to the next generation, but that doesn't mean that if there's a Huntington's parent in the home, 
that it may not have a significant effect on parenting. And so if you want to, again, look at the last 20 years, um, looking across multiple studies, family dynamics are absolutely altered in Huntington's families. Frequently, both parents are less than fully functional adults, and I can tell you that because I was... I watched my mother struggle to make money so that we didn't starve, and so my mother was gone and my father was sick and left my sister and me trying to fend for ourselves. So if, if you've got any DSM diagnoses back there in the corner, it's okay. I earned it. <laughs> um, so kids who are raised by their affected parent are less likely to establish close bonds with their own kids. Their adult attachment patterns are often insecure or preoccupied those insecure attachments occur more frequently in people who are exposed to Huntington's disease earlier in their life, which makes sense. But in spite of all of this, growing up in a Huntington's family does not in and of itself have a negative effect on a kid. And how can that be? Well, I think that there's compensatory mechanisms. I don't think we've studied them, but I think there are ways that people adapt that allow these kids to grow up okay. It's good for me. Okay, so um, touched on the issue of, of stigma and discrimination. So I'd, I'd like to sort of turn from how people adapt and cope with this personally to what kind of external factors affect um, uh, their experience of, of going through genetic testing. So LaVon Goodman, um, who's an internist and a, a Huntington's family member like myself, um, wrote this, which I thought was really interesting. And so she says that there's four different kinds of stigma in Huntington's disease. One is professional stigma, meaning that there's all this inaccurate information about Huntington's that floats around and gets distributed to Huntington's families. And the very fact that that is the case, families tend not to show up until they're in massive crisis, the healthcare professions only see people when they're massively in crisis, and so all of a sudden, Huntington's disease is the most devastating disease ever because it's not seen across the whole life spectrum. So it's a selection bias. There's also a self-internalized stigma, that is, our culture believes that if you're genetically healthy or you're not mentally ill or disabled, that you, you tend to be a more worthy and con contributor to society. Um, Stigma by association, I've got my family in the back of the room and I'm not going to associate with them because they're making the most noise back there, or they're the weirdest family, you know, in the neighborhood, whatever. And then finally, the, the stereotypes that are associated with sensational marketing. And some, so there's these terrible stories that are distributed about Huntington's disease on the internet and, and in marketing and awareness and fundraising materials, and that tends to promote the stigma associated with HD. Nonetheless, genetic discrimination is real. 46.2% of people report that they have some form of genetic discrimination in terms of relationships, insurance, employment, or general transactions. So most of you know about GINA. Um, it provides some limited protection for health insurance and employment discrimination. It's important to note that all that means is that a company cannot ask you what your family history is. That doesn't mean if you're talking to the person in the next cubicle to you and you happen to, the boss walks by and you happen to be talking about your dad who has Huntington's disease, there's no protection there. The only thing they can do is not ask you. Um, it also doesn't protect against discrimination for disability, long-term care, or life insurance. And finally, GINA claims are extremely complex to execute. And so the, the last time that I looked at this was right after GINA was, um, uh, passed, and at the time there was no case law, and so I thought, well, maybe there's case law now. Um, but there's really not. Um, the EEOC, who files all employment-related um, claims, has only filed three cases in federal court, none of them related to Huntington's disease. And the Nestle case um, demonstrate how difficult it is to prove discrimination if they, can, if they can't go in and see a discriminatory practice that's across multiple employees, it's not going to make a difference. It's going to be very hard to prove. And you can imagine that if one person with Huntington's disease, they just would not have a very strong case. <laughs>
So another question that people at Hun with Huntington's and their family asks is not only will people stigmatize me and so forth, but who's going to take care of me when I get old? And who's going to take care of me when I get sick? And so um, Skirton and his group looked um, to see what families' experiences of this were. And they reported that very few people will have an accurate knowledge of Huntington's in the medical community. There's inadequate community resources, and there's absolutely no individualized care. And that's really true in North Carolina. So um, a couple of sobering facts, and that is that the average cost of annual health care per person in the United States is $8,200. For Huntington's fam patients, it's $3,200 in stage one to $37,000 in stage five. Um, that doesn't take into consideration other costs, like caregiving costs. You can see here that that's estimated to be $10,800 of lost income just for six and a quarter hours of care every day. Um, this was done in a group of people who were sort of mid-stage with HD. And it, if I haven't impressed you yet, this is everybody. So in North Carolina, it only costs $74,000 to have long-term care in a facility. Up here, it's $125,000. So how do you help a family prepare for this? So like I said, what do people at risk care about? So the first were about um, how am I going to handle this? How is my family going to handle this? The other factors are all about how are people out there going to treat me? So I'm going back to my sister again. That's us when we're little girls up top. This is right when we were getting ready to graduate. My dad's in the back there. And so we, like I said, we graduated from college. We went off on our separate lives. I went to med school. That's about 10 years before my father died. And then this came across my desk. And it sat there for a year. Um, so this was a year after the gene was discovered. And I read this article and I saw the predictive testing guidelines and all of that and I said, okay, so that's the way it has to happen. But I also saw the immense anxiety in the treating community about taking care of people with Huntington's. It was very clear to me they thought everybody was going to be at very high risk of suicide, which didn't give me a great deal of confidence that I was going to be able to handle it very well. So I went off on a path. Um, I found a great psychiatrist who just works with doctors spent a year talking to him about what I needed to do. Um, and at the end of that year, I made a decision to get tested. Um, as Ruth mentioned, I'm extremely fortunate that I'm gene negative, not so lucky for all of my family members. But one of the things that I can say, I, several things I could say about genetic testing, but the one thing that I think has, that resonated the most to me through all the stuff that I read was that medical genetics does not provide a straightforward guide to morally sound conduct. It's just so much more complicated than knowing what your genes are. There's so many other factors involved in the choices that you make in your life that genetic information is just one piece. So um, one of the things that, so in the dark places that I went through when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I sort of thought back through my father's life and, um, you know, he fought in World War II. He was married for 50 years. He had six kids. All of us are college educated. Um, we all work. Um, he started two um, uh, factories out in eastern North Carolina, hundreds of jobs, um, was a pillar of his church and of his community, gave back as much as he could. Um, and then he got sick. And in the course of his illness, um, he suffered with tremendous dignity. He was a happy man to the day he died. And so it's pretty hard for me to look back on that life and not be really grateful that I'm alive and very grateful that he was my dad and very grateful that he was my father. So like Oriana, here's what I've learned in this war, in this country, in this city, to love the miracle of having been born. Thanks. Questions? Has there been any study on 
the effect of knowing that testing is possible on people who don't get tested or on the well-being of people who don't get so tested? So that was an exceptionally good question. Um, so the question is, so you've got all this information about these people who've gone through genetic testing. What about the people that don't choose to? What about those people who choose to not live in the arena of um, Huntington's disease? And, and the truth of the matter is, we don't really know. I mean, you know, 80% of people don't show up. And you, it's really difficult to go looking for them. Um, the, best, uh, the best way I know about that is that when we have somebody come into clinic, I always say, would you like me to meet with your kids? And they go through all the same things that I discussed my sister and I go through. Some of them decide to get tested and some of them don't. Some of them decide to get tested at one point in their life or another. Um, and I, I, no, so the answer to that question is I don't, ha I don't have that information and I think it would be terrific information to have. It would just be very difficult to get. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.